Thank you very much, Peter. I am absolutely delighted to be here tonight. After you lock yourself away for many years writing a PhD on a topic, it's extraordinary that anyone wants to hear about it, really, and to find an uh, audience that is so far willing to listen to it is absolutely lovely. So thank you very much to Open House for this opportunity. JJ uh, Clark is in amongst these people here. This was a photo we found doing the research for the book at the State Library of Victoria. I won't ask you to guess which one he is. He's the second from the left at the back. That's him there, with a very bushy beard. If only I could grow a beard like that. He's 23 years of age there. And at that age, he'd been an architect already for nine years. He arrived in Victoria in 1852 on board an immigrant ship. His family came out seeking gold and its fortune. And he came out with him he came out with the family carrying this, a project that he'd drawn at school the year before at the age of 13. And it's an absolutely, I'm sure you'll agree, magnificent piece of draftsmanship. It's a map of Liverpool, his hometown, and I went into the British Library to have a look at contemporary maps of Liverpool, and I asked the librarian in the library to pull them all out, and I got them out, and I could see that Clark had drawn elements from lots of different maps and brought them together and created something greater than the sum of its parts. And I realised there that what I was looking at in this little map, this school project, was really the blueprint for how he does his architecture. He draws from lots of sources, pulls them together and creates something better than those sources put together. It truly is the key to understanding his architecture. So he brings this with him to Victoria at the age of 13. He arrives, actually the ship is arrives when he's 14, he turns 14 on the voyage over. His father takes him along to the colonial architect's office. They present this map. This is a time when all of the draftsmen in town and the architects and the builders have all disappeared off to the diggings, just at the point that Melbourne is desperately in need of infrastructure. They hire him on the spot, give him an adult wage and say, get designing Melbourne buildings, which he does. At the age of 14 or 15, he reconfigures Melbourne's post office. He goes on at 15 or 16 to design the Supreme Court in Geelong, the Customs House in Geelong. He comes back to Melbourne to design the Government Printing Office, which you can find behind the Treasury Building, and he's off and away on, an, on a remarkable career. A career that lasts from the gold rush until the First World War, an extraordinarily long career. And in that time, perfectly coinciding with the period in which Renaissance architecture is in vogue in the colonies in Australia. And Clark, through that career, spans the entire breadth of the architectural styles derived from the Italian Renaissance. And here are some of them. This is the Royal Mint, 1871. Rather ironically, now the Hellenic Museum, but this is about as Italian as you can get, this building. Sourced from perhaps the Palazzo Vidoni Caffarelli in Rome by Raphael. And uh, a beautiful building midway through his Melbourne career. Here is the Kew Asylum, which he did in association with a guy called Frederick Kawaru in 1864, one of three asylums in Victoria, the others being in Beechworth and Ararat. Here is the Supreme Court building, based on the four courts of Dublin. Now, he can't claim to be the architect of this, but he was the clerk of works and brought a semblance of sanity to the construction of this building, which had been incredibly scandalised from its inception to the point when it was finally finished. Here's another of his building buildings. This is the City Baths, one of my favourite buildings in Melbourne, a beautiful, whimsical, eclectic building coming at the point when the Edwardian Baroque is influencing Melbourne architecture. Melbourne architecture is at a crossroads at about 1901 and different styles are beginning to come into vogue and competing with, with uh, academic classicism. Clark reinvents himself in association with his son Edward and they design the city baths. This is another one of his buildings, Government House. He hasn't had a lot of credit for this, but he really was the principal architect. William Wardell, who was the Inspector General of uh, Public Works in Victoria, got most of the credit for the design of this, but he was utterly dependent on Clark to pull it off. Clark was the great classicist in the department. Wardell was a Gothicist. He designed St Patrick's Cathedral but he needed Clark to pull this remarkable building off, Australia's greatest vice-regal residence. Here's another one of his buildings, 
near the end of his career, in fact the last building he worked on in association with his son, the Queen Victoria Hospital. This is the only wing that's unfortunately left. And this is all just some of the other stuff that he did in his career. I want to talk about this building. This is the first iteration of his design for the Treasury. And you'll notice it's not as we know the Treasury today. It has an attic on it. And this was his original conception, which he was asked to put together at the age of 19. So he was five years into his career at this stage. Charles Paisley, who was running the department at that stage, turned to one of the youngest architects in the department and said, please design our grandest building to date, which Clark did. Now, there are a couple of mysteries about this building. The first is we don't know what happened to the attic. Well, we know it didn't get built, but we don't know why it didn't get built, and we don't know at whose behest that attic disappeared. The other thing is, during the construction of the Treasury, Clark disappeared for about eight months on a grand tour of Europe, which was a rite of passage for young architects. And somewhere along the way, this design morphed into this, which is the Treasury as we know it today. And just up here in the corner, which you can't really see on here, there is a little drawing which indicates what happened. At some point, Clark decided to turn his Sansovan-esque attic-based building into a classic Italian palazzo. And he must have done that at the time that he was travelling Europe, through Europe, through the cities of the Renaissance, particularly Florence and Venice and Rome, and looking at buildings like these. This is the Palazzo Farnese in the top left-hand corner, Palazzo Strozzi in the top right, the Palazzo Medici, and down here in the bottom left-hand corner, a building that has many similarities with the Treasury, the Villa Garzoni in Ponte Casale in Italy. And here we're seeing again Clark drawing elements from each of them and pulling them together to create something that is the greater than the sum of its parts. But then he went on to Britain. We suppose he went on to Britain. We don't have his itinerary, but we can guess that he then went on to Britain and looked at how English architects had gone to Italy and brought back Italian designs, revived them in Britain, and created the English versions of the Italian Renaissance Palazzo. We have uh, the Reform Club, up in the top left by Charles Barry, the Westminster Dormitory up in the top right by Lord Burlington, Charles Cockrell's Ashmolean Museum and Taylorian Institution in Oxford in the bottom right, and in the bottom left, Pitsanger Manor by George Dance and Sir John Soane. These were all influential. I'd like to add another one to the mix, which is this building. This is the Free Trade Hall in Manchester. This has many similarities with Clark's treasury. This was illustrated in the Builder magazine in 1856, just to the point when Clark is designing his treasury. And if you look at it, there are many similarities between his treasury facade, which has this wonderfully complex arrangement of double columns and recessed arcades and edicules and balustrades and all sorts of other things working for it. And it's very similar to the arrangement in Edward Walter's Free Trade Hall. In fact, even the differences underscore the similarities because here you see these roundels and this moulding inside the lunettes or the archivolts within the arches. And they're very similar to Clark's original drawing for the Treasury. So I think we can point to the Free Trade Hall in Manchester as being a very important precursor for Clark's treasury. What I think is the greatest Renaissance revival building in Australia, a truly beautiful building, which has such wonderful harmony and such great proportion, mirroring as it does many elements from Italian palazzi, but drawing them together in this way which is so harmonious and beautiful. Now, I'm not allowed to pick this building as my favourite building. I was asked to nominate another one, which was a real challenge, I can tell you. And I canvassed around for buildings and spent uh, a day roaming around Melbourne trying to nominate what was my favourite building, given I wasn't allowed to nominate this one. And the one I came up with in the end may surprise you. It's not anywhere near as complex as this one. And it's this building here. You may know it. It's the Signal House in the Flinders Street Railway Yard, or it was in, within the yard. It's now just outside the yard. I watched this building for many years as I caught the train into Flinders Street Station. 
I admired it. I thought it was a beautiful building. I thought, what a brilliant place that would be for a really upmarket restaurant sitting there in the, on the um, edge of the Yarra. Then it burnt down and it was derelict for two or three years. And in February 2010, it reopened with this design, quite different, of course, to the original, but it's now a venue for young kids between the age of 13 and 20 as a workshop for various cultural and artistic endeavours, and its philosophy is that it's free and accessible. I think it's a beautiful rendition and reiteration of a building. It's given a it new life, and I love its philosophy of being free and accessible to all. Thanks very much.